Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com and celebrity spokesmodel for the ClassicsToday.com merchandise shop, which you all should visit for all the cool stuff we have on the homepage of ClassicsToday.com. But now I am here by popular demand to talk about one of the most problematic boxes of CDs that have come my way in many a moon. It is this monstrosity. Here we go. Maris Janssen's The Edition. The Billboard. Whatever the heck this thing is. Well, it's an album size. Remember they did these for some of the Bernstein things on Sony and Deutsche Gramophone and the initial Pavarotti edition before they ignored it, then boxed it up. And these things, I don't know what we do with them. They don't fit anywhere. They're impossible to store. And, uh, you know, it seems that the weirdest packaging these days is coming from uh, orchestras, you know, that make their own stuff. Why? Because they hire these design consultants who want to make the product distinctive. And distinctive it is in the sense that it's completely useless when you have to store it or put it someplace where you're going to find it. It's there to make a statement not for the convenience of the classical music listener or collector. And that is a statement. The question is, what is it stating? I think that Maris Janssen's is the poster child for everything that is wrong with the way classical music is produced, packaged, marketed, sold, documented, preserved, or otherwise mummified which is what's happening these days. Just a, a day or two ago, I did a little talk called, about Simon Rattle called The Conductor Shuffle, about how conductors have their annual repertoire and they go from orchestra to orchestra to orchestra to orchestra doing it, and the orchestras record all of it, and they release all of it, and it's all for local consumption, even though it has, it has sort of international releases. It has illusions of international relevance, but it doesn't have any because it's the same stuff all over again. And Janssen's is, is absolutely, I believe, the most over-recorded conductor of, so far, the 21st century and possibly the 20th as well. It's really unbelievable how much of the same stuff he did, given how limited his range as an artist was. I mean, really, he was not a bad conductor. He was a decent, reliable conductor. He made some very, very fine recordings. And the fact of the matter is, if for example, we could wade through all of this stuff and pick out a couple of dozen fabulous recordings, and there are, there are some, and put those in a box, and that would be his legacy, then the history of conducting would be entirely different. I would be sitting here saying, oh, he was one of the great conductors of the, the last hundred years because uh, he did this incredible box where everything is fabulous. And oh, isn't it such a pity that he didn't survive to do more, that his stupid record labels wouldn't let him do more, and that we can't have more? Well, we have more. And the lesson of having more is that it's way too much and never should have been made. It does nothing for his reputation, nothing whatsoever, no matter how loving or respectful or well-prepared the edition is. And this one, this one is particularly irritating for some reasons we're going to go into. And I have to say, straight up front, I haven't heard the whole thing yet because there's stuff in here that hasn't been released yet. But there's a reason I haven't heard it yet, and I'm doing this talk now. And we will get into that momentarily because I think I have a moral point that needs to be made. Anyway, let's, let's recapitulate, shall we? Maris Janssen's began life, more or less, with the Oslo Philharmonic, and he was recording for Chandos. He did a very, very fine Tchaikovsky cycle. He did a really second-rate Rachmaninoff Second Symphony. He did a lousy Mahler Second Symphony. He did a bunch of things for Chandos, not too much, just the Tchaikovsky, which deservedly received a great deal of acclaim. He was pigeonholed as a fine conductor of Russian music, and this particular pigeon actually fit the whole quite well because he was a very good conductor of Russian music. He really was. His outstanding achievements are that Tchaikovsky cycle on Chandos, the Rachmaninoff symphonies and other orchestral music on EMI with the St. Petersburg Philharmonic or Leningrad or whatever it was at the time. And finally, this box here 
of the complete Shostakovich symphonies, which he did with a bunch of orchestras, including the Bavarian Radio Symphony Orchestra, which is this thing over here for the most part. This is a very fine Shostakovich cycle, and he always was good with Shostakovich. So, so, he bounced around a little bit, and he wound up in Bavaria, happily ensconced in Bavaria. Now there, he made a bunch of recordings for Sony, which were released under the rubric, The Great Recordings. Of course, they always call whatever is sitting around in their catalog, um, The Great Recordings. And that was released on Sony oh, about a year ago or so. I don't have it here in the overflow room. It's, it's, it's over in Brooklyn. But that was that. All right. He was also at the Concertgebouw for a good bunch of time. And his Concertgebouw period substantially overlapped his Bavarian radio period, which meant that both orchestras were releasing things with him simultaneously, um, very, very frequently. And so thus, for example, we have this thing from the Concertgebouw, the radio recordings. 1990 to 2014. These are completely apart from the regular releases that they were doing on their own label, featuring him doing much of the same repertoire that you can find here. And I might add, in Warner's retrospective box here. <laughs> this is the Oslo years. These are his EMI recordings. So as you can see, or now Warner, so he did all this stuff for major labels. Then when the major labels tanked and the orchestra started doing their own stuff, he redid a lot of it. So let, let's just ask ourselves. Here we have a conductor who has a certain amount of ability. How many recordings of Rachmaninoff's Second Symphony or Shostakovich's Tenth Symphony or Sibelius's Second Symphony by any one human being, Mahler's Second Symphony, in their lifetimes do we need? Do we really, really need? It's And it's not a question of, you know, I know Ormandy, for example, and some people, Bernstein, they remade repertoire. Conductors who live a long time tend to remake repertoire, but they tend to do it at the beginning of their career and at the end of their career, you know, that kind of thing. Janssen's career that we're talking about lasted, what, three, four decades? I mean, it's a reasonable amount of time, but the recordings came so quickly, or in bunches together, like Rachmaninoff II within the same year, several of them. I mean, this kind of stuff is just loony. And that's what we're seeing here. It's absolutely nuts. So we, I, I already did a video about the Oslo years, where I basically said some of it's quite good, some of it's quite forgettable, and most of it is average. And that was his career. It was average. It was really average. Yes, he had important positions. He was well managed. And I want to say something right now because I see this in the comments. Something very, very clear. I am talking about the evidence of the recordings. What is left to us? I do not want to hear from anyone for any reason. Well, I saw him give a concert. It was a great concert. I had a fabulous time. Or the orchestra loved him and they enjoyed working with him and they thought he was just a terrific person. I don't care. I don't care if you had a good time. I don't care if it was the most thrilling experience of your life. That's hearsay. I wasn't there and I don't believe you because I can't confirm it for myself. That's number one. It's not that you're not right or wrong. You're, of course, you're right. However you felt was right. That's not the point. The point is, does the surviving evidence bear comparison with the best that's out there so that you as record consumers can make intelligent and informed choices as to how to spend your money? Let's not forget that because everything else is anecdotal and hearsay. Sure, orchestras liked him. Sure, you went to a concert and had a great time. Knock yourself out. That's wonderful. I know that may sound a little bit harsh, but this is the reality we're dealing with. You're being asked to spend money. How many concerts have we all been to, and I can attest to many, that were being recorded or I knew were recorded or were released later as air checks or broadcasts, and you listen to them and you thought, oh, I had such a good time that night, and you listen to it again and you just go, oh, really? That was wonderful. 
It's a totally different universe when something is preserved on recording and offered for sale to the public. And I think that for that reason, we have to dedicate ourselves to maintaining a certain objectivity and a, and a high standard for what we're expecting. It's not about one-off events. Now, most of these concerts were one-off events. How many one-time one events are going to be worthy of preservation? Not that many. So what do you think the average is going to be here? Seriously, let me tell you what's in this, this jumbo box here since we've gone through all this other stuff. Well, you know, let's, let's just kill both. Let's kill two birds with one stone because this one is quicker. This is the, the radio years, and I can tell you what's in it really fast because it's, it's only, I think, 16 CDs or so. It's not so big. And, uh, you know, some of the stuff is good, some of it isn't, but you'll see. You'll see what the repertoire is, and it'll be interesting to compare it to there. Actually, a lot of the repertoire here is more interesting than other stuff that he did later. And, you know, as I said with Simon Rattle, we stand a much greater chance of getting something memorable in a repertoire that the conductor only did once. Because when they repeat themselves, quite often, they, they only reduce the impression <laughs> that they may have made. The favorability quotient tends to go down if only one out of three of the same work is decent. What does that say about the guy in terms of consistency? I mean, it says he wasn't that consistent. But of course, it's not even fair to judge because who knows what happens on the day. He might have had indigestion. The orchestra might have been out of sorts. You know, I mean, it's, it's just so unfair. So, you get the Symphony Fantastique. He always did that very well. It's also over here. I think he did it twice over there. He, he did it regularly. It was one of his dad's favorite pieces, and he really knew it and, and, and worked hard at it. And you get Ravel's Love Alls. Who cares? Uh, Ludoslavsky, Concerto for Orchestra. Well, that's nice to have. Tchaikovsky 6. More Tchaikovsky. Tchaikovsky 6. You get Tchaikovsky 6 in here. You get it in there. And let me see what else. Wait a minute. Because we're only on... We're only on disc one, right? So let's see. Oh, yeah, the Berlioz. Is that in here, too? I think it is. Yes, Symphony Fantastique. So already we have two of them. Right? I mean, oh, geez. all right. Uh, Bar Talk, Concerto for Orchestra. Well, that that is in here. The Oslo years, at a minimum. And no, there's no Bar Talk in here, I don't think, because this is in alphabetical order. Thank God, at least they know how to alphabetize. That's so nice. Mahler 7, that's in there. Uh, let's see, Hindemith, Symphonic Metamorphosis. A wonderful piece that no one cares about these days. I love it. It's almost impossible to blow it. Um, and he doesn't. Then we get Peter Jan Wagemann's Moloch. Well, you're not going to hear that too frequently, unless it's in here too. Wouldn't surprise me, but no, it's not. Okay, good. Uh, Strauss. Till Euland, Spiegel's Merry Pranks, Webern and Somerville, Brahms first. Now, <laughs> Janssen's did a very good Brahms cycle in Oslo that was on C-Max. And really, the first symphony was fantastic. You can read the reviews on classicstoday.com. Really some wonderful stuff there. Do we need it again here? No, we don't. Not as well recorded. The Oslo one is wonderful. Uh, Schumann one. Sibelius one. Well, that's in here, minimally. And, uh, you know, pardon me for ducking out here. Let me move this over here so I can, I can stay in focus. Uh, oh, Schumann one. Schumann one is on here, too. He must have been playing it in both places that year. Uh, let's see, is Till Eulenspiegel in here? Yes, Till Eulenspiegel's in here, too. All right, so you get that as well. Uh, Bartok music for strings, percussion, and Celesta, which he does very well, always did. It's in here. Uh, uh, Beethoven's Egmont Overture, Beethoven's Fifth. Well, that's in here. Um, let me see, is it in here too? Is there any Beethoven in here? I wonder. Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, that's good. All right, we don't have to deal with that. Beethoven, okay, we just did Beethoven's so Symphony number five. Uh, Schoenberg, a survivor from Warsaw. Mussorgsky, Songs and Dances of Death. Janicek's Taras Bulba. Go by Dulina, Feast During a Plague. Well, that's a fun disc. That's just a fun disc programmatically. Uh, Stravinsky's Capriccio, Verez Amerlique. That's in here, I'm pretty sure. Oh, yeah, there it is. That was his, his piece du jour. Uh, Messiaen, Im au Saint Sacrement, 
Stravinsky Symphony of Psalms. That's in here. I'm reasonably sure. I'm reasonably sure. There, I don't know. My voice gets muted. Maybe I'm happy that that happens. I think it's in here. Well, uh, Stravinsky, Petrushka, Rite of Spring, Firebird. Maybe not. Okay. Uh, something else. Rossini Overture, La Casa Ladra. Berio, four dedications. That's fun. Edited by Pierre Boulez. I don't know what that meant. Poulenc, Concerto for Organ, Strings, and Timpani. That was one of these pieces. That's in here. I'm almost positive. Yes, there it is. You get two of them. How many conductors get to do two Poulenc organ concertos in their lifetime? Seriously, folks. Right? Louis, Louis Andreessen, Mysterian version number one. Okay. Well, that's nice to have. Strauss, Death and Transfiguration. That's in here. Uh, Rachmaninoff, Symphony Number no. 2. This is a terrible one. This is the one with the cuts in the finale. Oh, God, it was horrible. Um, and let's see, was it in here too? Well, we don't, it doesn't really matter because, of course, he already, well, here's Rachmaninoff, The Bells and the Symphonic Dance, isn't it? Oh, Symphony of Psalms is in here. I knew it was there somewhere. It's coupled with Poulenc, um, which actually, well, no, it's not in here. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, here's a guy who did a great Rachmaninoff too. Um, on EMI with St. Petersburg, and two lousy ones. One on Chandos, and now this one. And then some Wagner stuff, and oh, Bruckner! <laughs> yeah, that, that kind of Bruckner. Symphony number three. Let's look here. Ah, here it is! You get two of them! Look at that. And let's see. Martineau. Violin Concerto Number no. 2 with Frank Peter Zimmerman. Yay, something interesting. You could have knocked me over with a pin. Uh, Prokofiev, Symphony Number no. 5. Oh, it's awful. It's just lousy. Um, everybody blows this symphony. I just don't understand why. And let's see. And Mahler 4. Well, that's in here. And let's see. What else? Is there anything else? 14. No, nope. that's it. All right. So that's these 14 CDs, probably, well, how many, how many of it? Six out of 10, seven out of 10, 70%, something like that. You can also find in here. And you can do AB comparisons until you drop dead of boredom, which is basically what was happening to me as I was making these comparisons. So now let's take a look at this this behemoth. And this is, this is 60, 67, 65 CDs and one, two, uh, two DVDs, the Girl Eater and a Haydn thing. Um, and then uh, three CDs of Maris Jensen's in rehearsal, as if we care, to watch him, you know, teach the orchestra how to play the music as dully as the recordings actually sound. So there we have it. It's like 70 things in here, and it's it's expensive. I mean, it's, it's something like 300 or more dollars that they're asking for this. And here's the part that really pisses me off, that really makes me angry for you, my friends, my wonderful friends, who are, you know, going to be out of pocket for this stuff. 90% of this stuff was already released. And if you go to classicstoday.com and look up Maris Jensen's, just do a conductor search under Maris Jensen's, you will find most of this stuff has been reviewed, and most of it is average. The reviews are, you know, six, seven, eight, six, seven, eight, six, seven, eight, which, which, is, which is decent. Decent, but not special. And that's what it is. That's really what it is. And then there are some things in here that are first releases. And those first releases annoy me. I'm going to tell you what they are. It's the Mass Number no. Three by Bruckner. <laughs> yeah. And then you get um, the conclusion of his Mahler cycle, which was never released separately. Mahler Three, Mahler Four, Mahler Six, Mahler Eight. Those are all in here for the first time. And this is the thing that makes me so angry. I haven't listened to them yet. As I said, I'm still in the process of going through these things that have not been released yet. But I am not going to recommend that you get this set simply because there are things in here that haven't been released yet, when all the rest of it has. I think it's a 
terrible, obnoxious thing to, for them to do in Bavaria. And by the way, by the way, um, you know, I asked my, my good buddy in Munchkin if, uh, if, if, if this is made for local consumption. I mean, if people are buying these things because they go to the orchestra there. And he said to me, he said, well, I have not noticed anybody on the streets of Munich running about with this under their arm. So that's all the anecdotal evidence I need. Anyway, my point is this. If they release the Mahler cycle separately, I'll review the Mahler cycle. But the idea that they're going to put these first releases in here to get you to spend several hundred dollars on useless duplication of repertoire, much of which has been reviewed and much of which is mediocre. I, I hope that doesn't work. I just think that's a terrible gambit. It's a ploy. It's not, it's not nice for you guys. If you want to hear his Mahler cycle, I don't know why you would. Most of it's been mediocre anyway. But let's just say, out of, out of sheer perversity, yes, you want the Maris Jensen's complete Mahler cycle. Wait till they release the complete Mahler cycle. Don't, don't waste your time on this stuff. I mean, just don't. I mean, it's bad enough I have to out of professional obligation, and eventually I will, but I'm not going to rush. I'm not going to do their dirty work for them and say, oh, look, it's got Mahler in it. Oh, come buy it. No way. So what else is first release? The Poulenc Stabat Mater. Oh, well, yeah, there we go. That was uh, in here, wasn't it? Maybe, I think, possibly. Um, maybe not. Oh, the Stravinsky. I don't know. One of those things was. And what else do we have here? Uh, first release. Shostakovich Concerto for Piano, Trumpet, and String Orchestra, Symphony Number no. 9. Well, uh, anything by Shostakovich in symphony terms is in here. Right? The Shostakovich box. Um, other first releases. Tchaikovsky, Romeo, and Juliet. Stravinsky, The Firebird. It's billed as The Firebird Suite Number no. 2. Who ever heard of the Firebird Suite Number no. 2? Wait, 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 wait. Uh, let me see. Let me see. I just noticed that. I was looking, I said, oh, the Firebird, you know. But then I looked at it just now a little bit more closely. And I see Suite Number no. 2. This, 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 this that does not make much sense to me. Wait a minute. Let's just take a look. Shostakovich, blah, 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 Saint-Saëns. Maris Jensen's rehearses. I don't know what he rehearses. Rehearse. Uh, let's see. Firebird. Oh, Firebird. Ballet Suite. Well, it doesn't seem to be the suite number two. It's the 1945 suite, which is sort of the, the longer one. But that's all it is. It's the 1945 suite. I've never heard that referred to as suite number two. So, okay. So that's new. And that's what the first of the rehearsals, of course, are first releases. If you are fascinated by first release rehearsals, at least they're not repeat rehearsals. Although, how do you do a repeat rehearsal? It's just a rehearsal. Well, never mind. So, let's go through this. Do you want to go through this? Well, we'll go through it quickly. And because, you know, things come in clumps and we can deal with it that way. All right. Beethoven. Symphony, oh, the Beethoven cycle. Okay, that came out before. The Beethoven cycle was Beethoven symphonies coupled with reflections. That is, you know, basically awful modern pieces inspired by the works, the Beethoven works being played. That's a gimmick. It's been done a bunch of times. There have been a bunch of live Beethoven cycles by various people where they commission modern composers because it gives it gives modern composers something to hang their hat on and it guarantees a performance. And most of these things are horrible and will never be heard from again. So we get that Beethoven cycle, which is okay. It's just average, right? And, and oh, but you also get a Vatican performance of the ninth. Yay. I mean, you can't have too many of those before the Pope, can you? Okay, Symphony Fantastique, Verez Ionization, Brahms, Symphonies 1, 2, 3, 4, which were already on C-Max. Um, Richard Strauss, Interludes from Intermezzo. Uh, the Britain War Requiem, that wasn't very good. And then we get Symphonies 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, and 9 by Bruckner. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Uh, Dvorak 8. Well, that's in, in, I think it's in here, isn't it? 
Yes, in there somewhere. There, he did a bunch of Dvorak symphonies. And let's see, there's five. There's nine. And seven and eight. Yes, he did them in Oslo. Why would you want to hear him do them twice? I don't know. I have no clue. Dvorak stop at Mater. Okay, that's nice to have. Although there's a billion of them now. Oh, then there was this vile, absolutely vile disc called Rhapsody. It has Espana, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue, Inescu's Romanian Rhapsody Number 1, Ravel's Rhapsody Espanol, the List Hungarian Rhapsody Number 2. It is the most joyless, dull, completely dead-in-the-water disc of light, entertaining, joyous, ebullient, fluffy, fizzy, effervescent music, theoretically, that has ever been released. It was such a dog. You can go read my review on classicstoday.com. Shockingly bad. All right, Haydn 88 and the Harmony Mass, which you can see being rehearsed. As I said, uh, Ludoslavsky Concerto for Orchestra, Shimanovsky Symphony Number no. 3, Simon Rattles Better, uh, <laughs> and A. Tchaikovsky, Symphony Number no. 4, not P. Tchaikovsky. That's the other, the, the later guy, um, which is interesting to have. Then you get the Mahler cycle, as if we care, um, that was uniformly uninteresting. So I doubt that numbers three, four, six, and eight are going to be fabulous, but eventually I will listen to them, and eventually I will know, and we may or may not discuss it. Um, and then we get Mozart, Requiem, Arvo Part, Berlin Rat, Mass, Poulenc, Stop at Mater, Stravinsky, Symphony of Psalms, Rachmaninoff, The Bells and Symphonic Dances, Simon Rattles Better. <laughs> yeah. Sanson Symphony Number no. 3, Poulenc Organ Concerto, that wasn't too bad if memory serves. Um, Shostakovich Symphonies 5, 7, and 10. Let me just talk about Shostakovich 10. Let's talk about Shostakovich 10. If you record it every 10 minutes. It's in here with Philadelphia. Fabulous performance. First rate. All the other ones that are scattered around here, nah, not so much. Not as good. And not as good at all. Um, let's see. Shostakovich Concerto we talked about. Symphony so 9. Shedrin, the Carmen Suite. Well, that's always nice to have. Strepper Spiegel, Pines of Rome, nothing special. Schubert's Great Symphony in C Major, nothing special. Um, Schubert Mass Number no. 2, Gounod's St. Cecilia Mass. That was very disappointing. I remember the review, the Gounod particularly. It had it had the, the ritualistic grandeur of Markevich, but none of the sharpness of rhythm. It was just soggy and boring. Yeah. Schumann 1, Schubert 3, Sibelius, Finlandia, Karelia, Symphony No. 2. Well, that's in everything he did. I mean, he's done that 150 times. Then we get a bunch of Richard Strauss's. Don Juan, Ein Heldenleben, Zarathustra, the Burlesque, the Alpine Symphony, Death and Transfiguration, the Rosenkavalier Suite, Till Eulenspiegel, the Four Last Songs. All right. I mean, it's Strauss-like. I mean, how many wonderful versions of, of that do we have? And are these just as wonderful as those? No. They're not. They're fine. They're okay. Stravinsky Petrushka. Well, that's that's in lots of places, including that's for sure in here. Stravinsky. Yes, Petrushka. There it is. Um, and let's see. What else have we got here? Mussorgsky Pictures in an Exhibition. The Rite of Spring and the Firebird. Well, you know. Eh, that's the Firebird Complete, not the Firebird Second Suite. <laughs> um, some of these are in here. Let's see. The Rite of Spring is in here. And... Shostakovich, there's more Shostakovich. Symphony number no. six, it's in here, and it's in here. Well, actually, the one in here is the same as the one that's in here. And we have Tchaikovsky Patatique, that was on Chandos, again, um, better. And then Romeo and Juliet, Firebird, Amaric, which we already talked about. The complete Tchaikovsky Peak Dom, Queen of Spades, wonderful work, amazing opera. Um, not a bad performance of it. Do we need it in the context of this? Well, you decide. Uh, you decide. And then we have those DVDs, including the Girl Leader and the Haydn thing that we just talked about. And uh, the rehearsals. That's what's in here. That's what's in here. For the money, for the quality, for what you're getting, you'd be insane to buy this. Absolutely insane. Go. Go to Bavaria. Go see how many people are running around like this, with this under their arms, through the quaint, snow-covered, old European streets. None of them. I'm telling you. None of them. I wouldn't. I, I just think it's, it's a scandal, frankly. 
that this guy has had so many recordings made and they have not helped his reputation at all. You know, you can just keep, keep throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks. That's the approach that, and it's not fair. It's not fair to us. It's not fair to Maris Janssen's. I really, I mean, if I were a conductor these days, and this is, I can only speak personally, I would be so jealous of my legacy. I would be so careful. I'd be like Brahms. You know, Brahms destroyed all of his sketches. He only published what he could control absolutely and what he thought was the best. And even there, there were some things that weren't the best, you know, like Ronaldo. You know, he liked Ronaldo. Does anybody like Ronaldo? That's the point. You know, even then, you're not going to bat a thousand, but you can bat 900. And that's what a, a conductor these days has to do. If it means that only a handful of recordings survive, a, you know, a solid handful, 40, 50, a nice box, a cube, good. It's enough. The less we have, the better, if it's the best quality. But if it's just what happened on the day, which is what all of these things are, this is what happened on the day, what happened on the day, and what happened on the day was average. It was an average day, an average day, and I just think to spend $300 getting a 70 or 67 CD box of average is really a bad investment, both of your time and of your money. So that's the story, friends. Keep on listening. Thank you for joining me. Take care.